preach the word, not the governor will preach my life, or we would really be in trouble. But Psalm, and Psalm 66, Psalm, and verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to look at 8 and 15. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Look at verse 8. O oh, bless our God, ye people. Make the voice of his praise to be heard, which holdeth our soul in life, and suffereth not our feet to be moved. For thou, O oh God, hast proved us, tested us. Thou our God hast proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Thou hast brought us into the net. Thou latest affliction upon our loins. This is what God has done. He's saying this is what God has done. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and through water, but thou brought us out into a wealthy place. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee with my vows, which my lips have uttered, and my mouth hath spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings, and with the increase of rams I will offer bullocks of goats. See, yeah, I forgot children's church. The, the children you go to children's church. Father, we ask your blessing now as we look into your word. Father, may the Holy Spirit be our teacher today, we pray in Jesus' name. The, uh, one of the greatest <coughs> revivalists in America's history, especially in the first Great Awakening, was John Wesley. And John Wesley, as you know, from him came, sprung forth the Methodist movement in America. But when Wesley first came to the United States, he was not saved. Uh, he was an ordained minister, but he says he was not saved. Now, Wesley kept a journal, and from 1736 to 1738, Wesley spoke an awful lot about the Moravians. On his first journey to America, he encountered on the ship not only people from England, but people from Germany, the Moravians. And throughout his journal, he would interchange, going back and forth, calling the Moravians, sometimes Moravians, and sometimes uh, Germans. But these Moravians had a tremendous effect upon his life. And on January, he writes in his journal, January 25th, 1736, he wrote this. At seven, I went to the Germans. I had long before observed the great seriousness of their behavior. Of their humility, they had given a continual proof by performing those servile offices for the other passengers which none of the English would undertake, for which they desired and would receive no pay, saying it was good for their proud hearts, and their loving Savior had done more for them. In the midst of the psalm, in the midst of their worship service, uh, wherewith their service began, the sea broke over, split the main sails, covered the ship, and poured in between the decks, as if the great depth had already swallowed us up. A terrible screaming began among the English. The Germans calmly sung on. I asked one of them afterwards, was not, this is not, this isn't how I would write this, I have a little better command of, of English, grammatically, I hope. But it says, was you not afraid? He answered, I thank God, no. I asked, but were not your women and children afraid? He replied mildly, no, our women and children are not afraid to die. I went to their crying, trembling neighbors and pointed out to them the difference in the hour of trial between him that feareth God and him that feareth him not. At twelve the wind fell. This was the most glorious day which I have hitherto seen. So what had happened is they were on this ship and they were having a, the Moravians were worshiping and out of nowhere came this tremendous storm and it broke the sail and the water began to pour into the lower decks and the, the ship began to flood and looked as if the ship was going to be lost at sea, that they would be drowned. 
And when faced with imminent catastrophe, what did the Moravians do? Well, they didn't curse the storm. They worshipped God. What a lesson. Do you know the, the Moravians at one point, you can still visit their this site. Excuse me, this prayer site that they had uh, over in Europe. But at one point, they had a 100-year prayer chain that went on. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Someone was meeting in this tower where they had this prayer, prayer meeting. Went on for a hundred solid years. I heard a story of a, a in most recently, just last century in the 1990s. I'll tell you about who it was. It was the Brownsville Revival team were traveling by airplane. And they hit tremendous turbulence, and the plane was really being knocked around. <clears throat> I flown four times in my life, white knuckled on every takeoff, but uh, uh, we had a little bit of turbulence coming from Miami back into Pittsburgh. I, pe I picked people up at the Pittsburgh airport and they looked green. And I knew you could hit some turbulence coming over uh, Smoky Mountains and coming into the Alleghenies, uh, coming into Pittsburgh. In fact, we had, we had a little bit of turbulence, nothing terrible, but it, you know, I said to Kitty at one point, my kids were little, I had charge of the, the girl, she, Jordan was a baby, this is a sidebar, but I said to Kitty, what should I get these kids to eat? The girls were little. And there was a choice between a sandwich and vegetable soup or lasagna. And he said, get them lasagna. Microwave lasagna with a, with a plastic fork and our youngest daughter, Alice. They're, they're still servicing that plane, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> there was lasagna. I said to Kitty, I can't get this off the window. She said, pull the shade down. And I did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we hit some turbulence coming into Pittsburgh, and the stewardesses sat down. They put the fasten your seatbelt. Stewardesses sat down, but they put those jump things on it, went up over their shoulders, and snapped between their legs in the seat. And I looked at them. I want one of them. <laughs> if this thing's going down, I want that. That looks like a pretty neat flotation device, too. <laughs> but <clears throat> this Brownsville team hit tremendous turbulence. And they were really getting knocked around. <coughs> and one of the team noted that the people from their church were worshiping. And they said later on, they told their team leader, we thought we were going to die. We thought at any moment we would see Jesus. Others, not, not as pious. So these Moravians, what did they do? They didn't curse God. They didn't curse the storm. What they did is they praised and worshipped God. And I want to talk about that. In the heat of battle, we can choose to blame or curse God, <coughs> or we can worship God. Now, <clears throat> I am by nature a warrior and complainer. That's not bragging, that's just the truth. It doesn't take much for me. My wife is snogging, shaking her head. We didn't ask for any, uh, any help on this today. So. But I am. And I worry at times. And I can complain. But I've learned through life's experiences that the battle goes a lot better if, we, if in the midst of the battle we can worship God. I want to look at two, two people. I'm going to look at more than two people. I want to look at two first who chose to blame or curse God. If you want to, you can go to the book of Ruth and keep your finger there for a minute. Ruth chapter 1 and verse 20. But Naomi, the book of Ruth is about Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, Naomi and her husband, uh, Amalek, <clears throat> were from, uh, they were from Bethlehem, Judah. And Bethlehem means house of bread. Guess what happened in the house of bread? They had a great famine. The house of bread had no bread. And, <clears throat> pardon me, Naomi and her husband fled. They heard there was bread. They heard there was uh, not a famine in Moab. So they fled to Moab. And they had two sons, Malon and Chilion. And their names meant sickly and wasting away. <laughs> it's like to name your kids like that. They're sickly. Oh, look, it's a little wasting away. 
But it's, it's significant because what would happen in Moab, they ran away from the famine, but the famine found them. And a famine hit the land of Moab. And what happened? Her husband died. And then her sons died. In Bible days, what was a sonless, childless widow to do? What was she doing? There, there wasn't, there was no social security. There was no welfare plan. <clears throat> How was she going to fend for herself? Now, Naomi's name means pleasantness. Pleasant. She heard then that God had visited Bethlehem again, and the famine was no longer there, and there was harvest and food and bread there. So she's going to go back and the last thing she needs is two other people to be responsible for. Her. So she tells her daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpha, not Oprah, Orpha, Orpha, to stay back. You know the story, Ruth doesn't want to. You know that, that treat me not from departing from you. It's a beautiful passage of scripture. But uh, she decides, okay, she'll take Ruth with her. They go back, and what do the people of her town, her village, her region, who remember her, they see her, they embrace her, and they say, oh, pleasantness, pleasant, you're back. And what does she say in verse 20? And she said to them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara. Call me bitterness. Call me bitter. And then she says, why? For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call me, me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. What did she do? She blamed God. She cursed God. You know, we just read in Psalms, you know, thou hast cursed me. Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but thou broughtest us out into a wealthy place. He says, for thou, uh, thou broughtest us into the net. Thou laidest affliction upon our loins. See, David was actually saying, God, you did these things, but he wasn't making an accusation. He was still worshiping the whole time through that. We always seem to want to assign blame. I've worked customer service for 20 some years, 20, uh, 21 years. Can I tell you something about, you work in the public, you work with the public. <clears throat> tell me if this isn't a true statement. Whatever is going wrong for people, it's never their fault, it's always somebody else's. Absolutely. You know? Why didn't my provider tell me this wasn't going to be a covered benefit? Probably because it's not his insurance that you Sorry, that gets out there and uh, hope he's not taping that. If it is, unemployment's fairly low, I'll find another job. <laughs> <laughs> it's always somebody else's fault. And where did that stuff start at? Well, I'll tell you where it started at. The woman that you gave me, she caused me to sin. Well, it wasn't me, it was the serpent that caused me to sin. You remember years ago they used to have those t-shirts, the devil made me do it? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> i tell you what, when the devil made you do it. We sin because we yield to the temptations. We give place to the enemy. So <clears throat> Naomi is blaming God. Can you think of another person now? I, I was <coughs> getting ready. I want you to know I did not pick this next person only because she's a woman. This isn't a woman thing, this is a human thing. But turn to the book of Job. Job chapter 2 and verse 9. Now Job loses everything and he suffers intense physical pain. I cannot imagine all that Job lost in such a short amount of time. His, his livestock, his wealth, his children, his health. If ever a man had a right to complain, it was Job. And what did Mrs. Job tell him? Curse God and die. It just isn't worth you living anymore. Curse God. God's at fault here. And 
then Job said unto his wife, Dost thou still, she says, Dost thou still remain, retain thy integrity, curse God, and die? But he said unto her, this is verse 9 and 10, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? <clears throat> and all this did not Job sin with his lips. In fact, Job said at one time, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. <coughs> What did he say? Well, that's the rest of that verse go. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be God. Can I tell you something? This is me speaking. It sure is good when he gives. It is really good when he gives. But oh boy, does it hurt when he takes away. I don't like it. I don't like it. But you know what? When he takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. When he gives, blessed be the name of the Lord. People say to me at times at work, I'll say, how can you be so happy? You, you, you joke around loud. You really like to laugh. What made you that way? It's because I cried a lot, too. All of my grandchildren have asked me about my because they figure I'm 150 years old. You know? <laughs> and, uh, they think I'm old. But my granddaughter, I showed her a picture of my dad when he was in the service, and she said, What happened to him? I said, Well, he died when I was a little boy. I said, And I cried. And she said, I cried too, Pop. I said, Oh, I know you did. I said, You went to the funeral with us, didn't you? She said, I went there. I was there. I said, yeah, I said, you rode in the car with us, the limo. She said, I ride that car. Listen, we have a lot, a lot of things in life we cry about. There's a lot of things we rejoice about. When God gives, thank God, bless you, Jesus. I thank God for my family. I thank God for my wife, my daughters, my son. Thank God. I thank God for the dogs and the cat and the grandchildren. That's great stuff. Sometimes God takes away. Sometimes we lose. And it's hard. And we're not saying that you can't mourn. We're going to talk about mourning in a minute. But somewhere in the midst of our losing, we still have to be able to say, blessed is the name of the Lord. Don't curse the circumstances. Don't curse the disease. Worship God. Worship God. Worship through life's worst days. <clears throat> Paul said, and everything give thanks. <clears throat> he didn't say, he didn't say, thank God for everything. I don't thank God for disease or sickness, but I can thank God in the midst of disease and sickness. I can think of a lot of the horrible things that could happen to me physically. And I pray they don't. And I would never thank God for them. I would never thank God if I were to be diagnosed with cancer. Or be diagnosed with, you know, if suddenly I, I would lose this boyish look, this, this, this chilling look of a, of a fine looking man. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't be thankful for that. But I could be thankful in the midst of all of that. Thank God. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. When we're persecuted, <clears throat> worship God. You say, well, there's no persecution. Yeah, you can be persecuted. You can be persecuted where you work. You can be persecuted. You can be persecuted among your own brethren. You know, Paul, all the things that Paul suffered, you know, <coughs> having been uh, beaten with 39 stripes, having suffered uh, physically, and, and having uh, gone without, having been hungered, and he said, uh, having the daily care of the church upon him. And he also said, and having suffered at the hands of false brethren. You can be persecuted even in your own. Jesus was persecuted in his own house. What did the apostles do in Acts chapter 5? When they called, Acts chapter 5, verse 40 and 41. When they called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus. And they let them go. <clears throat> Gamaliel had come to their defense that 
they had that trouble. They still beat him. I can't they wouldn't want to be beaten. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. <clears throat> That's not fair what they did to them. Not fair. But guess what? Life is not fair. But God is good. First prayer my mother ever taught us. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our, by his hand we are made. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. But God is, God is great and God is good. Even when it doesn't seem like God is being good. I like that verse in the back. The fig tree shall not blossom. And there be no hurt on the stones. The labor of the olive shall fail. There be no fruit on the vine. Be no herds in the stall. He goes on to say, Yet will I rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. But if you look at that verse, it doesn't look like God is doing a whole lot of saving at that moment. But yet he's going to rejoice in the God of his salvation. God is good. God is good. <clears throat> Turn to 2 Samuel. Pastor touched on this. <clears throat> I did more to touch on I think he preached on it a couple of months ago. 2 Samuel chapter 15. Verse 12, or uh, 2 Samuel 12, verse 15. And the king's servant said on this is when, uh, the, when Bathsheba gave birth to the child that was the result of David and Bathsheba's illicit relationship. <clears throat> but the king's servant said unto the king, Behold, thy servants are ready to do whatsoever, my lord. I guess I'm in chapter 15, I apologize. We're going to go there in a few minutes to at least look around. Chapter 12, verse 15. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought the Lord for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay, up, lay all night upon the earth. David's in intercession. And the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not. Neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died, and the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How would he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that the servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose <clears throat> from the earth, and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came into his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now that he's dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. We worship God even in our grief. There's nothing wrong with grieving. It is a very important part of our life when we have lost a loved one or have lost someone. Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. You know, it always amazes me when I hear Christians say to other Christians, uh, oh, you shouldn't be acting like that. They're in heaven. Well, that's wonderful. I'm glad they're in heaven. But I know one place they're not. They're not here. And that's where the hurting is. That's where the grief is. And mourn. And weep. Go through the stages of, 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 of the shock and then the mourning and the grieving. And it takes time. But what helps us pass through that time is that we worship God. We worship Him. That's what David did. People say, uh, aren't you over that yet? I don't know that we ever get over it. I think we adjust. We make an adjustment. But it takes time. But how, what's the vehicle in, in grief that helps us the most 
It's the worship. God is good. God is good. Brother John Bunny, Brother Hubert Bunny, Hubert Bunny was my Bible school president, but John Bunny was his brother. <clears throat> when they were in Bible school, they lost a child. And uh, John said to his wife, Do you want to go home? I'll pack up and go back to Ohio. And she said, Why? She said, That's Egypt. We're here on God's plan. God's will. And he said to her, I just don't know how you're going to make it. She said, I don't know how you're going to make it. She said, but I know this. God is good. God is good. Sometimes it hurts so bad to be able to get those words out. We know it in our head. We may know it in our heart, but it's hard to say it. We have to look, look away from the circumstance of, of the loss and we have to look to him who even at this very moment the angels are declaring the goodness and the greatness and the majesty of God on high. God is good. Now 2 Samuel 15, when you're betrayed, David was betrayed by his own son. He was betrayed by his own flesh and blood. In uh, 2 Samuel 15, verse 12, <clears throat> and Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilal, while he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy was strong. For the people increased continually with Absalom. There came a messenger to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom, or they're totally committed. David, your kingdom, it's kaput, it's done, You're, it's over. Throw in the towel. And David said unto his servants that were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee, for we shall not escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us suddenly and bring evil upon us and smite the city with the edge of the sword. Verse 30, look what David did. It says, And David went up by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up, and had his head covered, and he went barefoot, and all the people that was with him covered every man his head, and they went up weeping as they went. What's David displaying here? Humility, brokenness, and contrition. All aspects of worship. It is the broken man that will worship God. It is the humble man that will worship God. It is the contrite heart that will worship God. He's a broken man. He's had, this guy's had more trouble. He shouldn't be king. He had trouble with the previous king. Well, how did that work out at times? Times he acted like he was a madman just to avoid capture. How did that work out for him? And now that he's king and he messes up with, with uh, Bathsheba <clears throat> and his son Absalom, you got to get the old man out of there. Now he's being betrayed by his son. He's a broken down man. Brokenness is healed by brokenness. You know what I'm saying? When you're broken down, stay broken before the Lord. Stay humble. Stay contrite. Pour out your heart before the Lord. What do we do when, we're, when we feel like we're not worth anything in this life? I tell it to Jesus. I love that hymn. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You have no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. If you're broken, tell it to Jesus. If you're sore, scared, frightened, tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. In Psalm 57, if you turn over with me, David faces strong opposition. We just talked about him fleeing from Saul. And he's in the cave at Adullam. Verse 4 we read. 
My soul is among lions. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. I'm in, I'm, I'm in hot pursuit. They're coming after me. And these aren't, these aren't nice guys. These are mean men. These are cruel people. And what does David say? Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they are fallen themselves, Selah. And what does David say? They're plotting against me. They're, they're setting me up. They're going to try to trick me in my ways. They're going to try to capture me and torture me. And David says, my heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and heart. He's stirring himself up. David's saying, listen, it's hard to worship right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wake, wake up the worship in me. I myself will wake early. I will praise thee, O Lord. Among the people I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great under the heavens, and thy truth under the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. He's under a tremendous amount of stress. And what does he do? He says, I'm going to worship God. And when I can't worship God, I'm going to stir myself up to worship. I will sing and give praise unto thee. Awake soul. Awake heart. Awaken, O oh heart within me. I'm going to set my face toward worship. And what's the effects of keeping a worshipful attitude? By doing so, we acknowledge the goodness and worthiness of God. Now, we don't worship because our circumstances are good. We worship because God is good. We don't worship because we're blessed. We worship in order to bless the Lord. In the 30th Psalm, David writes, Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness, for his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Doesn't last forever. It seems like it. You ever seen, you ever seen like you're going through stuff that would never end? Never? Probably the question that I've asked my wife more than any other question. In, uh, in the 39 years of being together, 36 of, we're in 36 years, aren't we? 36 years we've been married. I tremble when I was trying to guess the years there. So. But the question I've asked the most of her is, is this, this going to all work out? Or another variation of that is, what's going to happen? You know what her answer has been? I don't, know. I don't know. But after 39 years of being a couple, 36 and a half years of being married, I'm now 57, and you've gone through a lot of things still. That's just not a DJ thing. But after all those experiences, I can tell you, things always seem to work out. We're still here. We have a lot to be thankful for. Now let's turn my morning, uh, reading on in the Psalms there, Psalm 30, verse 10. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee, and be not silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. It's amazing what praising can do. It carries us through the dark night. It keeps us and our ship afloat during the fiercest 
of storms at sea. When we are encompassed about by 10,000, as long as we have one abiding within, we can stand tall and confident, knowing that no evil shall befall us. A lot of things can happen, but the ultimate evil of being totally perished will never happen. This is scripture about Jesus, and Jesus even quoted this part of this about his ministry. Psalm, or not Psalm, but Isaiah 61. Jesus, it's talking about Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Are you brokenhearted? He, he's come to heal the brokenhearted. Thank you, Jesus. This is why I love him so. You know, one of the greatest things you can do for people that are brokenhearted is to love on them, to bless them, to bless your heart, bless your heart. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion. To give them beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Wow. He'll give you beauty for ashes. Keep worshiping him. He'll give you the oil of joy for mourning. Keep worshiping. He'll give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You ever feel heavy in your spirit? You ever feel depressed? Have you ever felt so depressed that you just felt like at any moment it'd be better just to die? I've been there. I've bought that. I've, I've, I've been there. I've done that. And I bought the t-shirt. At times we, we, we ascend to the highest peak and then there are times when we are down in the lowest of valleys. But the God of the mountain is the God in the valley. Amen. The God of dry land is the God that parts the sea so that I can walk on dry land. I have nothing to be, the year of times I have nothing to be thankful for, I have nothing to worship. Man, my circumstances really stink right now. Man, wow. How can you even expect me to worship? Lift up your voice. Shout unto God. God inhabits the praises of his people. Things happen when God's people begin to worship. He will give you the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That you might be called not a twig, not a weed, but you might be called a tree of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why are we going through these things? So that he might be glorified. God takes the circumstances to work a work in us so he can work a work through us. That's a lot of platitude, I know. But it's true. Why should I worship him? Because he's worthy. Thou art worthy. To receive glory and power, honor and riches. It's easy to worship when he has been blessing me <coughs> beyond measure. The Lord giveth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It's hard when he has taken away. It's hard. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. But in the seasons of the taking away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul said that he reckoned that the, the sufferings of this present life cannot be compared with the glories which shall be revealed in us. Hang on, my friend. Hang on. This is but a temporary thing. Don't fear but those that can kill your body, you're those that can kill your soul, bring damnation upon your soul. Just a moment. 
before we know it. You should see him who suffered for us on the cross. He's worthy. Sisters, have you come? I think it's page 100. Thou art worthy. He's worthy. <coughs> now let me tell you this. <coughs> going through something and it's hard for you to worship, get a worship partner. Help, Help me to worship. Sometimes you have to pray the pump. It's easy for me to worship when I'm amongst a bunch of people that are worshiping too. One thing, David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the and to inquire in his temple. So here we are. We're in the house of the Lord. We're going to inquire of the beauty of the Lord. We're going to, we're going to behold the beauty of God. And we're going to inquire in his temple. Some people have said, I've heard people say this already. When people are going through tough times, they say, you should question God. Oh, I do question. I don't question his character, I don't question his goodness, I don't question his righteousness and his holiness, but it's okay to say to God, why? He may not answer. He just may lovingly touch your heart and give you the grace that you need to pass through the moment. But asking questions is an important thing. There are some there are some things that are that come naturally natural to human beings, and one is the need to tell their story. I hear stories every day in my life. I, I'm given more information than what I need. To, I don't need a whole lot of information. <coughs> my job. I don't need a whole lot of information to process what's happening. You went to the dentist and they didn't pay your claim. You want to know why? I don't need to know that it was a snowy day. You drove 15 miles in the snow to get there. Somebody had verified your benefits before you got there. And then you were wearing a, a blue blouse, and the, the, the thing that Dennis put over you was green, and it didn't match, and your hygienist was mean and had bad breath. I don't even know all that. And I guess, you know, I try to be as empathetic as possible. This is why you're playing to pay. It's not a common benefit. End of case. Next case, please. But people have a need to tell their story. So what do you do? Let them tell their story. God, God's told his story, has he not? And people also have a need to ask questions. Questions should never be viewed as something, uh, something threatening. Or should they be viewed as a rejection? A question is really a request for more information so that we can process what we're going through. And sometimes God does give an answer and the answer is just says, my grace is sufficient for you. Some people say, well, when we get to heaven, we'll understand. I think a lot of what we're wondering about now when we get to heaven ain't going to matter. Just as it matter. I criticize John Wesley for his English, not look at me. It ain't going to matter. But he's worthy. Do you believe God is worthy? We have stated, let's, before we come to the order, let's sing that thou art worthy. It's number 100 in the uh, celebration. <coughs> he's worthy. He's worthy. Um,